My name is Phil Mackey, and this episode is all about one of the great single-game performances in NFL history, Adrian Peterson's record-breaking 296-yard game against the San Diego Chargers in 2007, a game that Judd Zolgad, as the lead beat writer for the Star Tribune, Access Vikings. Hey, hey, Phil Mackey. Uh, I also covered that game for the old KFAN.com back in the day. Our crew for this episode, Judd, myself, producer Declan. Declan, how old were you during the Adrian Peterson 296 yard game? I had just started high school. I was a freshman in high school. I remember watching it vividly. So I was fi- uh, 14 years old going on 15. I mean, it was, and we're going to dive into all aspects of it here. And Brooks Bollinger, who handed the ball off to Adrian Peterson a lot in that game, is going to join us later on in the show here. But let's, as we always do, set the scene. And if you're interested in what is the Minnesota Sports Rewind, what are you guys doing here? Uh, This is a podcast series turned into a live radio show here, and uh, there's about 13 episodes available, I believe 12 or 13 episodes, on the Minnesota Sports Rewind podcast feed. Apple, Spotify, Score North app. We do deep dives. We have guests. It's a lot of fun. But I'm going to set the scene and give kind of a summary of events, interject as you guys feel the need to, and then we'll get to our key questions and Brooks Bollinger. So the 2007 Vikings started the season Two and five. They were two and five heading into this game. Mm-hmm. And uh, at this point, the Brad Childress new car smell, if you will, had worn off. He was eight and 15 overall as a head coach going into this game. The Vikings used three starting quarterbacks during the 2007 season, due in part to injury, but also in part to just not having a true starting quarterback. Tavares Jackson, Kelly Holcomb, and Brooks Bollinger were the three guys in the mix that year. And uh, despite the two and five start, And despite not really having a true starting quarterback, there was still, oddly enough, a sense of confidence in the locker room because of two things. Number one, it was one of the greatest run-stopping defenses in the history of the NFL. The Williams wall, Mm -hmm. uh, you just had an unbelievable defense. That was even before they brought Jared Allen into the mix, but they still had had an amazing run-stopping defense. And Adrian Peterson had already shown flashes of being an all-time talent in that rookie season. So... Three weeks before this game, before he broke the single-game rushing record, he showed everyone in Chicago what he was capable of. 20 carries for 224 yards and three touchdowns at Soldier Field. He also had four kick returns for 128 yards in that game and the one, like, the 50-yard kick return that set up the the game-winning field goal. So he was already on the map. He He had burst into the starting lineup for the Vikings. Fast forward to Sunday, November 4th, week nine. The Chargers come to town. Young Phillip Rivers, LaDainian Tomlinson, and the Chargers take a 14-7 to lead going into halftime on Antonio Cromartie's missed field goal return of 109 yards from the back of the end zone. To say, I believe the Vikings got booed off the field, if I oh, remember they right, did. going into halftime. It was this awful. Game. Absolutely. And, and the interesting thing about that and going back and looking at this game, too, is the fact that at halftime of that game, which at that point in time, up until the Cromartie Return to me had been an incredibly nondescript AFC, NFC sort of, okay, get this done with game, was that Peterson had 43 yards on 13 carries. Yeah. So this is nowhere near the, oh my gosh, this is an incredible Peterson game. This was a game in which that uh, that Chargers team was good. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, they went to the NFC title game that season. Was it that year or the year before? One of those I think years. it was yeah, that they went, year. They went to the AFC title game. That season. And yep. so that was a team or a game where – Yes, when Cromartie took that um, 109 yard, so it's a long well field goal attempt, and Cromartie is basically standing by the goal post just in case it comes up short, right. which of course it does, and he gets the ball nine yards deep in the end zone. And that so became a like, thing. Like it was like a five year stretch that the, 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 the Auburn right, Alabama game. But like, wasn't there an later? NFL game right before that? I want to say Devin it was Hester? within. I want to say it was within a few weeks of that game, and I want to say it was before this game where a guy had done the same thing, and it was like a hundred six yard oh. return. Anyway, he gets the ball, he takes it back, and we're all like, "Oh, he's going to tackle him. Oh, he's going to get tackled here." Yeah, there's no way. Like. And, and so they get booed off the field. Peterson's got 43 yards on 13 carries, and this thing looks like a children's debacle. So they come out for the second half, and Adrian Peterson goes absolutely bonkers. Touchdown runs of 60-plus yards, 40-plus yards. He winds up with 296 yards on the game. The Vikings wind up coming from down 14-7 at halftime to shut out the Chargers in the second half. They win the game 35-7. to Uh, The Vikings actually went on to then win. A couple weeks later, they started a five-game winning streak, and they made it to 8-6 and in playoff position, and they had 
I believe it was a primetime game against like Washington in week 16. And yes. they wind up losing their last two games to fall to eight and eight. Yes. But Adrian Peterson's 315 total yards in this game were more than nine of the other 17 teams who played in the same slot on that Sunday. So he racked up more yards by himself when you include like the 20, uh, the 20 yards through the air too. Then Kansas City, San Diego, Denver, San Francisco, Atlanta, Arizona, Cincinnati, Carolina, and Tennessee that all played in that same time slot. And by the way, Chester Taylor also ran nine times for 60 yards in this game. Unbelievable. They ran for 350 plus yards in this game. And, and in fact, in the second to last series that the Vikings had in that game, we can certainly get into this. Chester Taylor got more carries than Peterson, who was on the cusp of setting the record. And we'll talk about this, but certain people didn't realize it. Well, let's actually start there just for fun. So Brad Childress was oblivious to how many yards Adrian Peterson had. Is that the story? Uh, the Basically, the story is this. The Vikings PR department between Bob Hagen and Tom West up in the press box saved the day. Because Bob, at one point in the fourth quarter, said, this has got to be yeah, getting close to what was the record, which was Jamal Lewis. Jamal Lewis is 295 in 2003. And so he started to dig and found out, but it was on the last series of the game with the Vikings having decided Peterson's day is done. Yeah, they're up by I, 21. I kid you not. Exactly. Uh, Tom West went upstairs to the coach's box and had to tell the coaches he's right there. And they put him back in, and he was, I believe, 38 yards away at that point. He got, they put him back in his first carry 35 yards. That's right. So now he's within two and they give him the ball and he basically just falls forward and gets the two yards. Peters. To the 30. They give him three on the play. That gives him 296 for the day. But without the Vikings PR department spelling it out and being aware, now I think. If you played that game now in 2020 or 21, I think the stats would be up on the scoreboard. Like everybody would be cognizant. Yeah. 2007, it wasn't, I wouldn't call the dark ages of stats, but you didn't have phones where everyone was following yardage and um, real time statistics on phones. Yeah, they didn't have like tablets on the sideline. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't recall the old Metrodome Phil scoreboard flashing. Adrian Peterson is at like 235 yards. <laughs> no, it was, it was flashing walks will haunt probably. <laughs> exactly. What was happening. And so, so the, the PR guys, Bob and Tom were basically the conduit to saying, Oh no, he's getting close. Yeah. That's amazing. Like, can you, cause on one hand, okay, you know, should you be just out there hunting for records? Like Ricky Davis tried to give give himself in a basketball game a triple double by missing, you know, like I think you want records to take place in the flow of a game. And you can make a case that, well, when you're up by 21 and there's only a few minutes left, like the game's over. But to me, the game flow dictates that you would just hand the ball off in those situations anyways. And so it, it wouldn't be like if you were still throwing the ball to get a throwing record. In right. That yeah. You're not trying it's to not, score touchdowns. Yeah. Necessary. You're not like out of, out of the norm to just be handing off to your running back in that spot. So, so key question number one here to start off the group of key questions, how would you characterize or put into context peak Adrian Peterson between 2007 sure. and like 2012, so that five years of just absolute peak Adrian Peterson, how would you describe that to, let's say, uh, even though you're not going to have grandkids, I think that ship has sailed, but like you're explaining yeah, to so. hypothetical Judd Zolgat grandkids. Unless I adopted kids now and had them have grandkids, <laughs> which is very weird to think about. Um, I would say that among the players that I, I saw in person, and the key word here is in person and or covered, Peak Adrian Peterson is the most dominant physical presence I saw. And look, it got to be a problem. He fumbled at times. But the thing that you always heard about P uh, Peterson, and it was absolutely true. And I don't know if it was always smart, but it was true. And it, was, it wasn't true that he was trying to do it, but he succeeded was Adrian Peterson runs angry, right? You always heard that. And it really wasn't all that true. Like he wasn't, he, he had a, a lot of turmoil certainly in his life and a lot of things as a youngster for him went wrong. Um, and so I think the national perception was he's angry at life and he's taking it out on the football field. And that, you know, for those of us who covered Peterson, 
at that point, he was a pretty gregarious, happy, go lucky, really, really talented, really, really good um, guy. But the whole thing was he's mad. He's mad. And if you did watch him play, if you didn't know him or cover him and go in that locker room, he ran like that. But the amount of contact that he was willing to initiate, the amount of times, and this got to be a problem too, but the amount of times that that contact led to plays where you said, Either go down or get out of bounds. And he absolutely would not. If you were to ask me about that guy that, that fell to the Vikings at the seventh pick in the 2007 draft, and really probably through what, Phil, about 2012 or so, mm -hmm. that was, he was a dominant. He wasn't, he could make moves and be flashy. But what I'll always remember the first thing that comes to mind about Peterson and Peterson's style of play was his willingness to absolutely go through people to get the arts. Yeah, the the words and phrases I wrote down, just thinking about that five or six year run, you may maybe include 2013 in there, but like that five or six year run, unstoppable. I mean, when you're when you're in one month in your rookie season, in one month, you're running for 224 yards on the road at Soldier Field, and then you come back home a few weeks later and you're breaking the single game record. I mean, that is as close to unstoppable at your peak as anybody in the history of of that position game breaker just and and i was trying to think of a word that would describe literally like at any time that dude could bust off a 75 yard run for a touchdown or could bust off a 35 yard run that would ice a game for the vikings or swing the field in a, in a certain direction in terms of his physique and just his power the guy looked like i mean like you and i were both you know around that locker room during that stretch and you know like that dude was chiseled out of granite. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't know if I've ever seen a human being as absolutely chiseled and just immovable as Adrian Peterson uh, physique-wise. I think he might be. I don't know how he would quantify this. And I think older football fans would vouch for, like, maybe Jim Brown in this right. category. But I, I think he might be the strongest running back in NFL history. Just the way that he would run through defenders, the way that, you know, think about some of the highlights that stand out. 2009, week one, where he literally, like, lifts a defensive back up with a stiff arm and shoves him out of bounds. The game against Pittsburgh in 2009, where he literally just trucked that safety. He used, he used him as a stepping stone, literally. It looked like that uh, uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark scene where the truck drives over the Nazi soldier. and You just see his, like, arms and legs flailing yes. up in the air. Yeah, That was Peterson against the, the Steelers. And then there's a million other highlights from, from that era too. And I know that you, Declan's probably too young for this game and Judd never really got into video games after like the early 80s. But Tecmo Super Bowl had running backs like Christian Okoye in the early 90s that if you use them in the video game, they would just run through defenders and it would just be this but those, noise. But those like guys, that's Peterson. But those guys did that. But think about their style and size. Yeah, the guys Okoye, who did that were just straight ahead guys. Earl right? Campbell. But those guys... When you looked at them, you said to yourself, oh, they go through people. Okoye, Earl Campbell, that group. Peterson had the moves and would use them at times. But I think if you went back and talked to him, and I don't recall if I got to ask him the question at the time, but I should have, which is, Adrian, if you can make a move, if you've got, it's you and a defender, and you can make a move, which you can, or go right through him, which would you take? And I think that era of Peterson would be like, eh, I'd probably go through him. He relished the ability to basically demolish people. Yeah, like I think but you're he right. wasn't built like he he didn't look like with Campbell. Earl Campbell would carry defenders on his back, and I think he enjoyed it. But you never said, well, you know what he should have done. He should have made a spin move. Adrian could have made that spin move, and at times I think elected did. to try and bowl over the defender. Right, and and I think. You know, if, if there was a sliding scale of running back styles, right? Barry Sanders is this elegant, dancing, right, exactly. sort of prancing, spin move, spin cycle running back who also was strong, but he was mostly just, he was, he was uh, like a juke lever on a video game, right? And then there was on the, on the far other end, I would say it's like the Herschel Walker end of the scale where it's literally just a block of granite that is running straight ahead. And has a hard time moving laterally from side to side. And Adrian Peterson had the characteristics of both those guys. He wasn't as nimble as Barry Sanders, but I think he had some Barry Sanders nimble qualities to go oh, yeah. along with that semi-truck brute force. And the other thing that we should talk about about that Vikings era and that team as well that 
I think Peterson would have been successful regardless, but probably helped a ton. That offensive line was a really good fill. Yeah. Hutchinson, McKinney, Matt Burke. I want to say Anthony Herrera was the right guard. And who was the right tackle at that time? Had, had we Hicks? Had we no, gotten no, it was Phil, the, Phil Odholt. Oh, that that's well, no, no, he came in two thousand nine. No, I believe, I believe, and this is not really good. I believe that that we had entered the very brief era of Ryan Cook, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, you're probably right. But let's just say Ryan that. Cook. But let's Ryan just Cook. But, Ryan Cook. but let's just say that Hutch Hutch was fantastic. The air just gets let out of the room. Oh, McKinney was fantastic. I mean, he was full of faults, but he was really good in his prime. Burke was really good, and Herrera was probably an under. Rated at that time, Ryan Cook is Ryan Cook. But I remember, I think it, it was, I think it was Hutch told me the story about Peterson. Somebody told me a story that that involved Hutchinson at one point in 2006 or seven. Told Adrian, slow down. We are opening up holes. You are actively basically on my back foot. You are, your foot is essentially touching my back foot as I'm trying to block. Let me block. That hole comes open. Just take a, uh, second hesitation, Adrian, and that hole's there. And he really couldn't do it. And the other guy that helped him uh, so much, and I believe he was in, I think he was with the team in 2006 and seven, um, and then went to the Jets, if I'm not mistaken. Tony Richardson, the fullback, yeah. who I think they signed from the Chiefs. Basically going into 2006, the story that I was told was, Tony told Peterson, don't worry about anything, just follow me. <laughs> because you don't know where the blocks are because it because in AP's world I think it was all instinctual and his instincts were off the charts but I think it was all instinctual and Tony's point was no there's actually a method to the madness of the blocking here so just follow me but I loved and he also didn't like playing behind fullbacks too he did is- not but Tony I think Tony was the guy who was like no 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 dude but the Hutch story to me was fantastic because that's the whole thing of if you if the really smart backs, if you just wait that tick, and it's probably a second, but if you wait that tick, that hole's open, and therefore you don't need to go through guys because yeah. they're gone. And yeah. wasn't that also why he lined up so far behind, like in a single back form, and you know the downhill runner? Because he was at least like, I want to say like three to five yards behind than the traditional running back would be in like a single formation. Yeah, if you go back, we'd have to go pull up some film, but it's, it does feel like he was like eight yards back, almost almost where a punter would be standing, right? right? Not quite that, that far back. Yeah. Um, key question number two for you guys, all right? And I want, I want Declan to jump in here on this too. We'll start with Judd. Where does Adrian Peterson rank for you among all-time great running backs? Where In, in your pecking order of all-time great running backs, mm. where is he right now? And just for a little bit of context, because he is, as, the, as of the recording of this, Adrian Peterson is still very active as a guy who's starting at times in the NFL. And he has made it now, he has made it to fifth on the all-time rushing yards list with 14,216. He is just about 1,000 yards shy of Barry Sanders and about 1,100 yards shy of Frank Gore, who was also still active, I believe, going yeah, into he's 2020. To yep. So Peterson could conceivably jump into the top three or four if he plays another year or two in, y- in total yards. And he basically That's missed incredible. two seasons, one suspended. Yeah. Well, part of another season with uh, with the injury. But he he's basically missed like a he season a and season. a half. Yeah. Where does he rank all time? I almost have to, in fairness to Peterson and the conversation, I almost have to draw a line circa 2012 or 13 because I, I believe this position has changed so much. And my my – Football argument against Peterson's style is it doesn't really fit now. He It still works. Yeah. I get it. But we're now in the versatile running back age of you can block, which he never could do. You can catch. He can catch a little bit. I don't think he's terrible, but he's not really good. But as far as just pure running backs that I've seen, he's in my top five as far as just pure. But but yeah. But I'm not trying to say that I would take him now in his prime the deficiencies now would be a big deal. In 2007, they were not. So I'd put him in my top five as that player. But just to be clear, if we're talking about if we're talking about running backs in 2020, I think the conversation is very different. But for a guy that came into the league in 2007, when you could still have your workhorse, he's the main guy, give him the ball, 
and just try and let him physically dominate on the ground, he's probably top five. What about you, Declan? I think if you're just looking at like bell cow running backs, kind of like Judd's talking about admitting what's happened in the last eight years with the position. Like you look at Emmett Smith and Walter Payton, you know, you think true running backs, Barry Sanders, I'll put in that list too. Mm-hmm. And then after that, I think AP slides right in. Um, someone like Ladanian Tomlinson and Marshall Falk, who were obviously good pass catching backs too. Like AP was never, I think, on the level of a Marshall Falk. And LT and AP are probably the two running backs that I would group together that I enjoyed watching the most from when I was growing up. And they're a little bit different styles. But I, I think if you're looking at a pecking order, I think, yeah, AP probably has a case for four or five. So I th- this is this is the list I threw together, and I have two different categories. I've got the pure runner, sort of the bell cow, like the use the the phrase that Declan used, and then the complete backs that would also fit in today's NFL a lot better. Mm-hmm. On the pure runner list, I think he's fifth. I think it's and and even like the the top four are hard to order. I mean, Emmett Smith has the most yards. I would say Walter Payton is probably number one on this list. And then Barry Sanders, Emmett Smith, and Jim Brown would be on this bell cow pure runner list as well in a totally different era of football. And then Peterson fifth on the list, ahead of like Eric Dickerson, ahead of Earl Campbell and OJ Simpson from the 70s. So I, you know, if if somebody wanted to fight and say, no, Adrian should be ahead of Jim Brown because of yardage, or Adrian should be ahead of Emmett Smith, because you could maybe make a case that Emmett Smith had better overall infrastructure championship right. rosters right offensive and, lines that were great and like longevity Forever. was emmett smith's friend as well like you right. could say that adrian peterson's peak was maybe better but, in terms of pure talent than emmett Smith. but let's just take what you thought of this player at their zenith because i think when, when we start talking about well this guy played for 14 years or this guy played for five years just as far as i'm concerned the peterson discussion is really a player i saw play from 2007 to 12 or 13 and then i just draw a line and say okay if you want to keep playing that's you but when we're talking about just the dominance of those first few years in which he was going through um the night that he tore his knee up in washington and came back then the next year and ran for more than 2,000 yards yeah that's one of the most impressive dominant guys at their position that I've seen in sports. So if it's just, if we're just taking pure peak level performance, which I think is a better indicator for where you stand, you know, I, like I've always made the case that Johan Santana should be right. much more considered for the Hall of Fame because for five or six years or maybe even eight years, he was one of the three best pitchers of his era. Uh, but if a guy pitched, if Mike Messina pitched for 20 years, we were more likely to put Mike Messina in. To me, and I'm not trying to take away from Emmett Smith. Emmett Smith is amazing. I think Adrian Peterson's zenith was more impressive than Emmett Smith's zenith. So I would put him above Emmett Smith on that list. On the complete backs list, I've got three guys for sure mm-hmm. that that move into this discussion. When you, I don't think they're necessarily at the top of this list, but Ladanian Tomlinson. When you talk about pass catching and all those things, Marshall Falk and Curtis Martin actually is one of the most underrated running backs in yeah. history. But he's a pass catcher. He's sixth on the all-time rushing yards list. Uh, so, and there's a couple other guys we could like Tony Dorsett. We could probably throw in there, but. Adrian Peterson's probably top five. And and if he hadn't, you know, we kind of poke him for sticking around maybe a couple years too long. But honestly, if he hadn't moved up past like eight other guys on the all-time yardage list by hanging around, I don't know if I would have said that today. The fact that he's fifth on the all-time yards list, I think makes a little bit of a difference because now he's got he's got peak zenith and he's got longevity. He won't go away, though, I think. the, the, The fact that he continues to play is fine. I just always flash back to his his greatness and i the the only thing that as a vikings observer for a long time that the bad po- the bad thing uh on the field that i'll always come back to is the fumbles the ball security thing like i can't get past that completely and that was somewhat selfish on his part because a lot of those fumbles were probably in retrospect avoidable but that being said i just always go back to that time period where this guy was basically he could do he could truck you or he could juke you and a lot of guys can't do both yeah his fumbles by the way they definitely tapered off after his first two or three years statistically but the rep but the reputation because of where some of the fumbles took place like it was (laughs) you know obviously the nfc championship game the seattle game yeah 2013 he caught the pass and fumbled and that but yes yeah no he had uh 
just to explore all angles of Peterson here, he had 20 fumbles in his first three years combined, not counting playoffs. Where uh, among sporting events, Phil, that you have uh, attended or covered, where does that day and that record in 2007 against the Chargers fit for you as far as as far as highlights of things that you have seen live? Yeah, I there's there's really I think there's two types of moments, right? There's there's moments that you anticipate. So game 163, I was at game 163. Well, you anticipated maybe even for like a week, like, man, they could, what happens if they tie? Oh, they're going to play a game 163. Well, that's going to be amazing, right? Like you can, and so you're kind of anticipating, and then that actually lived up to the anticipation. And there's all kinds of examples like that. I mean, you were at World Series games. I mean, there's, there's, there's anticipatory but excitement. How, but how about things you didn't expect? That's the other category. Because that's a special one to me. So I went to, I was at the Eric Milton no-hitter. Just my dad and I went to a random game at 11 a.m. on a Saturday or whatever the hell day it was. It was Saturday morning. And uh, it wasn't even on TV. I think that's why we went. We wanted to, I was, you know, my parents were divorced and I would go hang out with my dad on weekends and we would go to Twins games. Mm-hmm. Or we'd watch Twins games on TV, order a pizza. He's, hey, the game's not on tomorrow. Do you want to just go to the game? Let's we'll, we'll get like $5 tickets and go to the game. So seeing a no-hitter was pretty amazing. But I think there's something – I'd have to think more about like if there's other little pockets of things. That, like I was at the Cal Ripken 3,000 hit game. But that you kind of anticipated that too. Although he had like four hits in that four game. Hits, yeah, he had a big day. But they were handing out certificates. Like they were ready for it. Yeah. I think when you walk into a stadium and you see something – record breaking happen that you didn't expect to happen that's i don't know if there's anything i would put above it in terms of just like pure wow i can't believe i was randomly at that sporting event it's really high yeah yeah because you and and again to me the the, the special thing about that day as well was the vikings are down by a, a touchdown on a really weird play at halftime and peterson is having a completely nondescript day yeah you know and so at halftime the fans are booing. You're thinking, what are they doing? The Childress era at that point, sort of off the uh, rails, right? Because that 2006 team with Brad had gotten off to a really good start. And and I remember they went into a three-game stretch that I believe in October, uh, Halloween 2006, started with a game here against the Patriots at the Metrodome. And you thought, if they can win two or three here, they're in great shape. Well, they fell apart. He cuts um, Marcus Robinson on Christmas Eve. People hate Childress at that point. This team gets off to a, not a great start. And so going into that game, there was really just sort of a close to a toxic feeling about Childress and this team. And so that was a really cool just jolt of something good th- that uh, that the club had to have just to get back on track for a little bit. By the way, Al tweets into the show here at Jay Zolgad, at Dex tweets, and at Phil Mackey. Nathan Vasher was the one that returned for the Bears. Okay, a field you. goal, 108 yards in 2005. Devin Hester did it again in 2006, and then Cromartie did it against the Vikings in 2007. That's why I remember. Okay. And then we saw it was like four years later, five years. I think it was like 2011 or 12, or that uh, Auburn beat Alabama on the same thing. Alabama tried a long field goal, and yeah. Auburn returned it 105 yards or 110, whatever it was, for a game-winning touchdown. So we're going to take a quick pause here. This is Minnesota Sports Rewind on Score North. Phil Mackey, Judd Zolgad. Declan Goff on the other side of the glass. And we're doing a deep dive for this episode into the Adrian Peterson record-breaking 296-yard performance in 2007 against the San Diego Chargers. If you like Minnesota Sports Rewind, if you love this concept, go check out all the other episodes. You can binge them. Hey, we know you're just hanging out at home a lot more often, so put some headphones in and go binge the first 12 or 13 episodes. We've got stuff going deep dive into the 2009 Vikings with Sage Rosenfels, a bunch of great Brett Favre stories. And last week, we dove into the 2006 Twins with Justin Morneau, one of the great Twins teams of all time that wound up getting swept in the playoffs by the Oakland A's. But you can help out Minnesota Sports Rewind by going to Apple or Spotify and giving us a five-star review and leaving a little positive comment in the comment section and help spread the word about this new show to fellow Minnesota sports fans. When we come back, The man who handed the ball off to Adrian Peterson for that record-breaking three-yard run. He came in in relief of Tavares Jackson in that game. Brooks Bollinger with some stories next on Minnesota Sports Rewind. You're listening to Minnesota Sports Rewind. Welcome back to Minnesota Sports Rewind, a new show here on Score North where we do deep dives into prominent Minnesota sports events, games, moments, trades. You name it, you can find the full list of episodes we've already done 
and binge them wherever you find podcasts. Minnesota Sports Rewind, Apple, Spotify, and the Score North app. And Judd Zolgad, uh, the man who handed the ball off to Adrian Peterson frequently during that game after he came in for Tavares Jackson. Brooks Bollinger joins the show here. And Brooks, we appreciate you coming on. I was going to ask you, what's it like to hand off to a guy and watch him run for like 300 yards? But then I remembered you played at Wisconsin. So it's, it's probably like the ninth time that you did it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was, uh, it was, it was old hat for me. Uh, and, you know, I think you're asking the wrong question. What you really should be asking is, what did you do special with those handoffs? <laughs> 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 yeah, laces in or out, Brooks, when you're handing off to AP. I, I was thinking about I was thinking about over the last few years, and not you know obviously <laughs> with everything that's going on, I have a little more time. But I'm thinking about, it, especially with you guys playing this now and talking about it, maybe doing like a camp this summer, a quarterback camp that's focused especially on handoffs. <laughs> yeah, I, think, I like I think it. All these guys want, they want to talk about throwing the ball and footwork and all this other stuff. I think we could have a whole camp dedicated. Get these young kids uh, really fine tuned with the art of handing the ball off. I love it. So, Brooks, AP had uh, 43 yards on 13 carries in the first half of that game. So, and you you guys trailed by seven because Cromartie took that uh, long well kick uh, that was short or field goal attempt that was short, 109 yards for a touchdown. Uh, so, with all this transpiring, when did you first start to get a feeling on the sideline that this was going to be a special day? Third quarter? When when did it start to become clear that what had been an unsuccessful first half was going to turn into an incredibly memorable second half? Yeah, it was kind of just like an avalanche. You know, for me, it was so weird because you, you're kind of riding a roller coaster as a, as a backup quarterback and you're kind of watching one eye on every play right in the first half. Did Tavares get up and what's the defense doing? And, you know, um, am I going in this play, next play, whatever? And and then um, it happened so abruptly in the middle of a two-minute drill. It's such an awkward time to go in that I didn't even really wrap my head around exactly. Uh, I think I completed one pass and maybe it's a couple plays. And all of a sudden you're coming back off to the sideline. They kick the thing, kick the field goal, and Kamari runs it back, which was – like one of the more surreal things I've seen in a football game anyway. Um, and then you go to the locker room and just kind of, it's almost like a new game, you know? And I think pretty, um, by the time we scored, we scored the 14 points in the second quarter. Um, and then really when he scored the third one, I think after the pass to Sydney, it was, it was just an absolute avalanche. And it was just almost kind of like handing off and then jogging up and on the field and jumping on guys' shoulders. And just kind of, I think I remember with, with Burke just grabbing him after one, um, after we were chasing on one of them, and he just kind of started laughing, you know, because it doesn't even feel um, real. Um, but it was, it was a ton of fun, and you, you don't get to don't get to witness something like that every day. What is your, you know, we'd love for you to take us behind the curtain a little bit, and, and some of these huddles, like Adrian Peterson, or even on the sidelines. What was Adrian Peterson like in huddles on the sidelines? I mean, we've heard stories, and you know, we both covered that team as writers too. That you know, he he was mostly going off instinct as a rookie. You know, he didn't necessarily know like all the blocking concepts as as not many rookies would. Like, what was what was it like with him as such a young player, but so talented? Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. Like, you, you know, you just keep it pretty simple. And I think in general, right, we all you're kind of focused on your job, right? So I think, you know, you got your times uh, when you can when you can laugh and um, maybe provide a little color into the huddle. Uh, but for the most part, it's 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 uh, pretty much just operating as, as business as usual. But you're right about Adrian. So, you know, when you really get to that level and really you talk about the zone running game, outside zone, inside zone, the footwork, the pass, the tempo, it's it's an art, right? And that's the guy I played with in college, Ron Dane, uh, totally different skill set, but he was a master of that art, of that zone running game and that tempo. Adrian was not. Right, Adrian was a thoroughbred that was. I got one speed and I'm going, and uh, then I'm gonna hit the hole, stick my foot in the ground, and go uh, that direction. So the hard thing with Adrian was every pass, whether that was inside outside zone, or you you'd be running a downhill run like power or iso, or a draw play where he's supposed to basically pause for a second before he even comes forward to get the ball. It was all out the window. Right. So when you turned around, you're kind of trying to just figure out like this guy. And there's times 
where it felt like he was going to take your arm with you, you know, because <laughs> he, 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 he was taking the ball and everything else because, you know, he already had seen the hole and he was going to hit it uh, as fast as he could. So, yeah, it was an adventure. The protections, you know, I remember Eric Bianami just wearing them out day in and day out. And thankfully we had Chester Taylor and we're able to balance that a little bit. But, you know, he was a thoroughbred, you know, at that time and just one of the most gifted, talented people um, I've ever seen. Um, but he had one speed and it was fast. So, Brooks, I, I was told at one point, I think during his first year, um, that Hutch actually sat him down and said, Adrian, wait for my block because you are literally on my back and I'm trying to block and you're going through me and the defender. Just wait. And that AP never really mastered the art of the patience of of waiting for guys like Burke and Hutch and McKinney to complete their uh, assignment of trying to clear out the defender so that obviously the gap or the hole, Brooks, would be right there. Yeah, it, you know, if you can imagine, and I never have done it, right? I've never blocked anybody literally in my, in my life. But, you know, there's such a, there's an art and a timing to it. And it's so hard to get five guys you know, working in concert together, right, in general, just with steps and footwork and passing things off. And now you add the multiple defenses you see and how that's adjusting. So that's a whole other layer of complexity. But as you rep those, and that's why reps, especially in the zone running game, are so important because it's all it's like dancing, right, with a bunch of different partners. And, and those guys get so good, especially guys that have done it for a long time, like Berkey and, and Hutch, and they just get a feel and a rhythm for – how they're going to pass these combo blocks off and get to the next level. Well, you know, it's kind of like a quarterback that's in a clean pocket, not that I've ever been guilty of this, but that's in a clean pocket and just takes off running, right? And and they go, what are you doing? You know, like, this is where the pocket is. So it totally throws things out of whack now when all of a sudden the speed and the timing of that is completely sideways. And now all of a sudden the defenders are reacting in a way that don't make any sense to, to their path and their combos. So it's frustrating for them. Hutch is a guy that is never and never has been really afraid to voice his frustration. You know, he's, he's not afraid of a little uh, direct conversation. Um, so, yeah, it doesn't surprise me that he sat him down. And it doesn't surprise me. I don't think Adrian ever, um, that wasn't his game. You know, I think it is a, it's a skill set. It's an, um, something that you either kind of understand and have or you don't. And, and I think especially in that zone running game, like that just – he was successful in spite of not having that just because his ability made up for so much. But I, I don't think ever ideally suited uh, for a system where he had to kind of have that tempo and that patience. Well, Brooks – You know, Brooks, much like – go ahead. No, keep, no, keep going, keep going. Well, I think I think Ron Dane's the exact opposite of that, not – you know, and – some of you guys out there are probably Wisconsin fans, but um, and it's okay to be a Badger fan and a Vikings fan, by the way. Okay, it happens. I mean, but, it's it's sort of I mean, it's sort of questionable. You you played for both, so you have an excuse, but it's a little but, bit questionable. <laughs> um, yeah, I got plenty of problems, and we don't have enough time today to talk about all of them. But <laughs> oh, we got uh, all the time in the world. Actually, yeah, we have more time now than usual. We're all quarantined, man. You can talk as much as you want. Well, I can tell. I knew this pandemic was bad, but I didn't realize it was as bad as you guys calling me. And now I'm really worried. Actually, yeah. Do you want to, uh, what are you doing for the next three hours? If you'd like to just host right. Score North Live, too, you're welcome yeah. to. <laughs> I got I to gotta work and homeschool five kids. Oh, oh okay. My, time is way, my free time is cut down in the pandemic. Um, <laughs> but what I was going to say is, you know, Ron was the exact opposite. Ron was, I mean, he's about, you know, he just went from build. Right, he was um, built a totally different way, a totally different skill set. But Ron, if you go back and watch that tape, like he was unbelievable in the tempo and understanding of of how to pace himself, time it, hit the hole, and then and then put it into the next gear. So they just had, to, and then he went to the NFL, went to the Giants, and they ran all gap trap, power, ISO. They didn't run his own, right? And it was like setting the guy up to fail. You know, I still don't understand to this day um so anyways yeah i mean they're they're all built different when, when you get down in those nuances but adrian is just talented enough to overcome it a little bit so what was what was the post-game locker room like afterwards <laughs> that that game by the way i know you guys the, the next week against green bay was kind of a disaster but then you guys won a bunch of games in a row and got to eight and six so this game was a little bit of a springboard 
in some ways. But what was it like when you guys went back to the locker room and, you know, closed doors before media comes in? What what what, what stories can you tell us? Um, I don't know. I don't have any good story. You know, that wasn't the game that Shank got his pants off, was it? No, that was that was uh, a Detroit game. I want to at say. Ford Field the yeah. next year. Yeah, Shank was very impressed with himself after that. He was. He actually <laughs> held, he actually held a press conference the next day in the it locker room was, discussing it. Yeah, it was, it was very uncomfortable. <laughs> You know, I, I think, you know, you remember towards the end of the game, it was just like, you know, because you don't really, it all happened so quick and, and you're just, um, it wasn't, you know, where there's this record that we're building up to and we all know about it. And the fans are counting down the yardage or whatever. It's like, you don't even really realize what's happening. It's just like, holy cow, this has been crazy and a lot of fun, but you don't realize like there's a record on the line. I think you guys probably got the start from somebody else, but right. Like towards the end of the game, start to know he breaks the record, whatever. I mean, it was just, and for me, like, you know, the, um, you know, coming at halftime and play well, throw a touchdown pass and play. It was just, you know, it was, it was awesome. It was like a winning locker room should be, you know, I mean, the NFL is, um, it's, it's fun to have a job where you get to go in and just, uh, celebrate a little bit and uh but you guys know also in that industry and and know why that when you pat each other on the on the back and walk out the door and you know on to the next week so brooks you're you're at that point playing going into the last viking series against the chargers that day you're up by 18 peterson at that point is at 258 yards and the story is Tom West goes upstairs to the coach's box in the old Metrodome press box and tells them he's closing in on the record because Peterson's day at that point was done. Uh, He comes back in and gets 35 yards on his first carry, which puts him two yards away. As the quarterback playing in that game, did you ever become aware of the of the nature of what was transpiring here and the fact that he was so close or were you oblivious to it pretty much till the end? Pretty oblivious to the way in. Um, you know, I think I, I think after um, when he came back in and then we went off the field, then I think um, it, the chatter started to go around the sidelines. And uh, I forgot that West is the main – kick myself for that. I, Weston yeah. Hagen saved saved the day because Bob's the, Bob's the one who started to look up the records, and then West is the one who, who must have run upstairs and told the offensive staff, He's really well, close. What, yeah, what we really need to investigate on this is, is was it West or Hagen? You know, I, I think that um, that's what I really want to know is which <laughs> one are we giving the credit to? <laughs> Lennon and McCartney, <laughs> man. Come they're on. The they're the Lennon you know. and McCartney of PR teams, Brooks. You can't yeah, separate no, no. them. No, I think it's a little bit like the Belichick and Brady. You know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> hey, how long do you – one of them's riding on coattails, and I don't know which one it is yet. And I think I think that we should dedicate some time in this whole pandemic to get to the bottom of, you know, <laughs> who, who's really just uh, hanging out. We can do we'll just do a live a live uh, game show on on Score North here. Get them both. That's a great idea. Out, man. <laughs> so. Yeah. To answer your question, I, I yeah. didn't I didn't really know. You know, I, I kind of caught it at the end. It's like, oh, that's cool and whatever. Um, <laughs> but you know, you don't just you got to stay pretty focused to keep hanging those things off you know, uh, as well as I was. So it was, I didn't, I didn't You're doing a good job. Was <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, I was, I, I, play, I was listening, I heard the game or whatever, and, and it's like, you know, hand off to Peterson, hand off to Taylor, hand off to Peterson, hand off to Peterson. My dad, my, my kid's going, Dad, this is boring. Like, what did you, you know, did you even do anything? Um, but, do you do you do you have a football like an encased football somewhere with just your handprint on it from that game? You know, just like no. a, like an outline of your hand showing the greatness of how often you put that ball perfectly in the breast basket of Adrian Peterson. No, but I think now you say that I'm gonna do. I'm gonna I'm gonna get I'm gonna get one of those for you know because when you really think about it, I handed off to Ron when he broke the all time rushing record yep. in the NCAA, and then I handed off to Adrian. Um, in the all-time single-game rushing record in the NFL. Um, so, I, you know, I, I don't know. I, th- I think I'm going to have to – and I'm not a big I'm not a big memorabilia guy, you know. Like, I don't have the 
the jerseys and the stuff all over um, the house or anything like that or any special things kind of set up. But I think that's maybe the thing that, cause that's my legacy, right? I mean, at the end of the day, like that's, that's got to go somewhere. And I, I think, <laughs> you know, I'm going to get that up. I'm going to get on that. Now that Love, you it. Talk about. Love it, man. Well, Brooks, thanks for coming on with us. We appreciate you taking some time out of your, uh, out of your quarantine day here to share some Adrian Peterson stories. And we'll, we'll talk again soon. All right. Get back to those kids, right, those five kids. Yeah. See you, Brooks. <laughs> All right, Thanks, see, see you, Brooks. That is Brooks Bollinger. Uh, the statistics, he threw uh, seven times in the second half and one pass in the fourth quarter. And the one the one pass out of the but gate in the second pass. Yeah, it was it, like a 40-yard pass to Sidney Rice, Rice, right? Touchdown pass. So in our last few minutes here of this episode of Rewind, and I, I love Brooks, man. He's one of the, just the all-time nicest professional athletes you'll Very ever come across. He's as self-deprecating as you'll come across. Him and Brian Dunsing are the two most self-deprecating athletes I've ever met. We're like, both of them are kind of looking around wondering, why am I here? Like, what, what am hey, I? Hey, he played, though. Right. He but, played. But it's fun. It's fun talking with him. Where do you guys put Adrian Peterson in your all-time Viking pecking order? Oh, that's a loaded question that I need to give more thought to than off the top of my head. But, um, I think we did this once, actually. On we did it a few years ago. Mackie on the yeah. show. And I, dro- oh. I dropped him because he hung around and actually became, to me, sort of a detriment at times. But it, again, if I just go back to in their prime Vikings, Moss clearly n- number one of guys I, I saw. Now, I did not see, in fairness, I did not see Paige, except at the very end. Um, I saw Tarkington at the end. It'd be nice if someone could tally some sack statistics on the Purple People. We didn't too, keep to those till 82, know? baby. It's ridiculous. Um, but off the top of my head, I would say in a pecking order of which of guys I've covered, Peterson would be a solid probably number two or three. So here's kind of a list of guys just for reference. Randy Moss, Chris Carter, Frank Tarkenton's got to be very high on this all, list. All time for sure, yes. Alan Page, Jim Marshall, Carl Eller, Randall McDaniel, John Randall, Chris Dolman, Mick Tinglehoff. Yeah, all time it's going to be. He, I think he's, he's. I think he was seventh on my, something like that on my list that we did on the old show. I think you have to, like the guys you have to put above him for sure. I think you have to put Fran Tarkenton above him, the quarterback, Page. Super Bowls, Alan Page, Moss, Moss. You might even say like Randall McDaniel. It's, I know it's hard to compare right. a running back to yeah. an offensive guard, but Randall McDaniel is one of the great offensive he, linemen I, ever. Bill, I think I had him like seven. That sounds about right. That sounds about right. Like the guys that you would probably debate on. Okay, Mick Tinglehoff, longevity as a as a lineman, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, Chris Dolman, John Randall, ferocious defensive lineman, but I, I, I think he's kind of in that. Like you've got Randy Moss, Fran Tarkenton, Alan Page, that are kind of on the Mount Rushmore, and right. then you can debate some of the rest. I still don't get to this day, and and I, I know there was uh, some injury concern, and I want to say he came out of Oklahoma with a shoulder problem. I still don't understand to this day how he fell the seventh in that draft. It was the collarbone, right? I mean, that had to have been. Yeah, it. but he showed up at training camp with this little patch thing for it. It was really nothing big. And 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 now with a running back, I'd sort of get it right. The 2007 NFL draft and, and the Vikings, I think, were just elated that Adrian yes. Peterson fell that far. Right? Washington took so, that safety. Jamarcus Russell was the number one overall pick in 2007. Yep. Oof. Yep. Calvin Johnson, Joe Thomas went two and three. Okay. Two of the all-time greats. Fair. Gaines Adams, defensive end to the Buccaneers for. Yep. Levi Brown wasn't Levi Brown. Was he the dude that got hit in the eye with the? Uh, no, that one. No, that, one no. No, that was before him. Yep, that was early two thousands. He was an offensive I do tackle. Know who you're though. Talking about yep, Leron Landry, yep. safety. That's the one that where it was off the rails at that point. And then Adrian Peterson goes. But this is a great draft. Patrick Willis, Marshawn Lynch, Darrell Rivas. Are you saying the Vikings made this a mistake? Unbelievable draft. I, I had friends upset they didn't take Brady Quinn with that pick. I was one of those people, yes, by the way. I bet you were Notre Dame. <laughs> yeah, Brady Quinn. Uh, Ted Ginn Jr. I covered that draft, and I want to say that we all thought that Peterson would be gone easily within the first five picks. I have a trivia question for you guys to end the show here, okay? I'm going to put you guys on the spot. Mm -hmm. So Adrian Peterson, the all-time single-game rushing leader, 296 yards. Ten other guys have rushed for at least 200 – let me take that back. Thirteen other guys have rushed for – so 13 total. Twelve other guys have rushed for at least 250 yards in a game. In a single game, can you name them? One of them did it twice, so he's on this list twice. So Walter, really, really, there's eleven. Walter Payton. Walter Payton is one of them. Um, Marshall Falk. 
Marshall Falk never did. Yeah, and he was more multi-purpose yards too, probably. Yeah. Um, well, you already and Jamal Lewis was already named Jamal on the Lewis, show, so we'll yeah. throw him on here. Yep. Yeah. Did Barry Sanders do it once? Barry Sanders did. No, I'm sorry. No, he did not. Did not. No, okay. he did not. He uh, 237 was his high. Uh, Chris Johnson. Chris Johnson did not. Even that 2,000 yard season never did 200 once. Wow. No, 250 is the 250. Bar. Got it. Got yep. it. There's a few on here that are like, wow. All right. All that right. guy. Uh, Jer- Jer- uh, Jerome Harrison. Remember oh, Jerome Harrison oh for Cleveland? Yes. And I just read that, that name because he, he, I think he was the last guy to actually threaten the Peterson record. Yeah. 286 which, in 2009. Which, by the way, guys, that record. 296 might never be broken un- unless the game shifts back to how it was. Agreed. Or if like, like if, if a mobile quarterback goes bonkers or something. Sure, but, but who's going to let their bell – who's got the bell cow back now and will allow that? It, it would almost have to be a fluke, right? It would have to be like 20 carries and a guy busts off three 80-yard rushes or something you know, for yeah. touchdowns. Uh, Corey Dillon, Walter Payton, OJ Simpson, Sean Alexander, oh, Jamal Charles, DeMarco Murray, Mike Anderson, Doug Martin, Speck Sanders in 1947, who? and OJ Simpson again. Did you say Speck Sanders? And they have the ball to Speck Sanders, who breaks up the middle, and there he goes, Speck Sanders. <laughs> By the way, Andrew Zimmern is going to join Score North Live here next. Thank you for listening to Minnesota Sports Rewind, available on Apple, Spotify, and the Score North app. Please give us a five-star review Tuesdays and Thursdays at 11 o'clock on